Good morning, everyone. As we welcome and welcome the presence of God, I invite everyone to sing this song. I will bow to you as we prepare our hearts. This song. Let the song be our confession and declaration. Let us sing. I will bow to you. to you to no other God but you alone Lord I will worship you nothing hands have made but you alone one more time let us sing Lord I will bow to you Lord I will bow to you, to no other God but you alone. <clears throat> Lord, I will worship you, nothing hands have made but you you 
this be our prayer as we confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, that we want to follow Him with our lives. Let us lay down our idols, the thrones that we've made, the things that have taken our hearts, and confess that we will bow and follow Jesus. As we continue to sing, light of the world, and as we prepare our hearts for the word of God that we will hear today. Let us hear once again the calling we've heard from God. And if you're still waiting for that call, uh, let this song inspire you and move you. Let this be your prayer. Let us sing. <clears throat> I want to be a light to the nation. to be the salt of the earth to show forth your glory and tell of the story of your magnificent love one more time let us say I want to be to be the salt of the earth to show forth your glory and tell of the story of your magnificent love light of the world shine
Thank you very much, Sister Eileen, for leading us in um, that wonderful time of just praise and worship and the confession we've made to say that let the light of the world shine through us. I pray that those words truly resonate in your lives, that you become the, the light in your family, the light in your community, in your country, the light in SNU, in your class, and the light in this world. May that the ways that we've just sung become true in our lives. As we continue praying, I uh, want to draw your attention to the uh, prayer topics we talk, we pray about in SNUIC. Uh, let's continue praying for this world that we live in. As we've just confessed, we want to be the light of the world. And being the light of this world we live in means we need to pray and intercede for this world. A lot of troubles happening all over the world. And especially just even the country we are living in right now in Korea, we, see, we hear the cases that keep rising for COVID-19. Let's just continue praying that uh, it might not get worse, but may the numbers keep producing and that we may get back to normalcy very soon again. Um, let's continue praying for our university, Sonation University, um, our home for the time of our studies here or because of work. We just pray that um, the professors, the school administrators, uh, the students, and just that everything that happens here on uh, in SNU, not just in Pana campus, but other campuses too, that um, May God be glorified. And uh, we'll continue praying for our church, our SNUIC. We'll just continue praying for our uh, uh, brethren who are unwell. Uh, Wesley, let's continue praying for Brother Wesley. Uh, let's continue praying for Brother Dereje. Uh, good news is that he's been discharged from the hospital, but he's recovering from home. Let's continue praying for him. Uh, let's continue praying for Pastor David and uh, uh, Pastor David's wife, 
and also just praying for him, Pastor David. I think he's going through a lot this period, but uh, we thank God that uh, we can see the strength and the reliance he has on God, and that we thank you, Pastor David, for, for this encouragement and just continue praying him as the leader of SNUIC that God continue using him and continue praying for the church leaders too. Um, it's continue remembering them in prayers and we continue praying for the newcomers that the Lord brought to SNU. I see that they might find, they may find um, a family within uh, so National University International Church. And as we continue praying, uh, Sister So Young is going to lead us in a congregational prayer. See, the men in prayer. Chisong. Chisong was going to lead us in prayer. Thank you very much for reminding. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the most holy, most powerful, majestic God ruling the whole heaven and earth. No one else like you. You are the most holy, only living God. You are the most beautiful one. Thank you for giving us this week, breath every day, to wake up, to be blessed, and study and work as your chosen children and soldiers advancing your kingdom. Please look upon the world to take care of Afghanistan, Establish a good regime with a good leader to care for people in Afghanistan and protect in faith 25,000 Christians there. Your kingdom come in Afghanistan. Protect us people on earth from pandemic and let us turn to you in repentance. Please heal to help Mrs. Che and Dereje from collarbone rupture. Take care of his study and career and bless Mr. Wesley with proper visa to stay and work for you in Korea and heal totally from medical procedure of pancreatitis in his hospitalization because you are Jehovah Rapha healer God and Jehovah Roy shepherd God who guides us and takes care of us. Give each and every one of us your wisdom, divine health, inner strength, so that we could be serving you in each area of culture to your glory. Bless professors and your servant, Pastor David Che, to proclaim your words and counsel so that we all could be established again in your truth and serve and work for you, not to be shaken in the world. We bless, worship, and love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you. Um, I understand uh, scripture reading for this morning will be from our brother Robinson. Okay. Mark chapter 2, verse 13 to verse 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. Verse 14, as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Verse 16, when the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Hallelujah. Amen. Brother Robinson, thank you so much uh, for reading that portion of scripture for us. Uh, friends, um, I'm excited about launching a Gospel Christianity Season 2. I know that you've been following in your eye gathering, discussing, sharing your insights um, on the study of Gospel Christianity 1, which was a little more theological in nature. And we've really probed into the meaning of or definition of the gospel and what does it mean to uh, be identified as Christ followers who have embraced and really affected by the gospel of Christianity. And as we go into season two, this is second uh, segment of gospel Christianity number two. We are asking more practical questions of how to. How do we accept Jesus? How do we live in this world as followers of Jesus Christ? And uh, to begin with, we want to open up with this question, how do I, how do we, those of us who claim to understand the gospel of Christianity, how do we choose to follow Jesus? What does it mean? What does it look like? When we say we're a, we are a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, will it make any difference? And what does it mean? Is it a religious commitment? Is it a contract that we make? We, is it a covenant? Or is this a membership joining a certain denomination or uh, sign up, signing up as a member of a church? Will that count as uh, officially following Jesus Christ? These are all that very valid questions. And I want to begin by um, <clears throat> sharing this with you. Um, uh, we heard was based on the invitation of uh, Jesus calling his disciples. And we are, uh, there are a number of different passages that describes what happened when Jesus comes to a certain group of people to extend invitation to become follower of Jesus Christ. And from the various stories in the Gospels, uh, we find four different categories, the book of Matthew, book of Mark, book of Luke, and even uh, Gospel of John, describes a scenario where Jesus specifically calls a certain group of people to come follow him. And then um, uh, the Gospels would provide a list of 12 followers or disciples of Jesus Christ later on. However, the passage that we're, we'll be looking at is found in uh, one of the shortest Gospels of the four Gospels, Gospel of Mark. And in Gospel of Mark chapter 2, we find Jesus coming to Matthew, the tax collector. And this is uh, shared by the Gospel of Matthew and Gospel of Luke. And um, uh, we, we, we see a certain pattern that we could glean principles from. The, one of the things that uh, we could glean from the stories that we have just read is uh, specifically, how do we follow Jesus? How do I personally follow Jesus? I'd like to propose to you first, by surrendering to him. We follow by complete surrender, unconditional surrender, uh, complete surrender. And second is we follow not because we, we want, we have a shadow agenda. We have something else that we want to receive from Jesus, but we, we are completely, not only in complete surrender, but we worship him. Him because he is our ultimate um, being that we, we surrender our worship, our desire, our hope, our aspiration, our present and future. Everything gets surrendered to him as a form of worship to him. We worship because we find the most glorious uh, pleasure in, in simply worshiping him. And how do we do this? We could do it religiously. We could engage in various type of worship services religiously or social culturally. Many of us, especially in North America, I believe 
so-called Christianity has become a social cultural thing. So people identify Christianity as being social and cultural norm. Whereas in Germany, almost 98% of all Germans claim that they are Christians, but they are cultural Christians. They are they're, uh, political Christians. They have their names registered in Lutheran church. However, it, it really doesn't mean that they are actually living their life as uh, followers of Jesus Christ. So how do, how do we truly worship? And the third component is we really have to understand what it means to love him. We follow by falling in love with him. So those are the uh, uh, categories that I want to share with you. And um, the past that, passage that we have read uh, begins by, once again, Jesus went outside the lake and a large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of uh, Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. And he goes to uh, Alphaeus or Matthew. He says, follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him at once. Friends, you know that Levi was a tax collector. His life was centered around charging taxes on behalf of the Roman Empire, the conqueror, to the occupied Jews. His goal was to increase the difference so that he could make greater commission. So he thought he was doing a, a job and he created a very successful business um, by charging taxes, a little more than just nudging, just um, increasing the amount of tax due to the Roman government. And Jews hated tax collectors. They considered him, they consider all the tax collectors betrayers of the uh, nation. And he must have been observing Jesus for a while when Jesus came by his booth. He had heard about Jesus' description of God's kingdom. He probably heard that um, he healed the sick and opened the eyes of the blind and made the lame people walk and purified the lepers clean. But uh, he began to have this um, curiosity brooding inside of his heart because Jesus' description of God's kingdom was very different. So he was curious. But when Jesus came by his booth, he said, follow me. And without delay, he simply drops everything and begins to follow. Because Jesus had been speaking about the relationship with God, the creator. He knew that God was the creator. He is the only God, but only Jesus began to define him or, or speak of God, this God creator of the universe, as someone to have a personal relationship with. He would refer to him as a Abba Father. You know, many throughout human history use various adjectives to describe the creator God. For instance, omnipotent God, omnipresent God, omniscient God, eternal, God of all power, etc. But Jesus would speak about him as his father, having a personal relationship with him, just like a child would have a relationship, an intimate relationship with the father. Jesus taught that the first and foremost, we were created to love God and have a relationship with him, not because of what we could gain from him, but because God has first loved us and showed us love that loving him back is the ultimate allegiance to him and the best way to live and the only way to die and stand before God. His teaching was very, very different. Unlike any other rabbis, Jesus also taught our obedience to God is not a religious duty, nor a political obligation or social cultural responsibility, but knowing the one who calls is worthy of our unconditional obedience. These were radical views, something that no, he has not heard before. And Jesus began to, to teach um, Matthew that surrendering to him, surrendering to the one who has called us is, 
it requires unconditional obedience. Obedience is not an intellectual agreement or emotional consent, but yielding to the one who calls for obedience, even when you have a disagreeing disagreement or may cause you to lose what you think you would desperately need or what you cherish and value. You obey because you know the one who calls you, loves you, and is calling you and extending that invitation for your benefit. Knowing and actually doing requires obedience. So when Jesus came to Levi and Matthew to, to follow him, he simply got up and followed him. He made a decisive decision to follow him. On this day, Matthew made a decision that forever changed his life. From that moment on, he began to follow Jesus. We don't have much of the details, but he began to follow Jesus, not religiously, not social culturally, because it was the in thing to do, but surrendering his whole life to Jesus. He was no more tax collector, working for the Roman Empire, or trying to um, enlarge his, his personal asset. But he surrendered his life by following Jesus. And this is really becomes a little more evident by the fact that um, we, we find the next, next description in, in the scripture. And the Bible continues by saying, um, this is what happened. I, we really don't know how much time has passed, but while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, you see, um, Jesus went to Levi's house. We really don't know exactly how many months or how many weeks this time between the first calling of uh, Matthew to become a follower of Jesus to this particular dinner at Levi's house. Here we know that many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were, uh, who were Pharisees saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who needs, need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And that was the uh, recorded for, for us. Matthew's life must have changed completely. One pastor in the U.S. calls this particular scene as described in the gospel as the Matthew party. You see, Matthew was an accountant. He was a businessman. He was great with numbers. He was intelligent and well-connected with people in the Roman Empire and also the, the elites of the Jewish community. After following Jesus though, his heart's priority began to shift. It was not the same. His interests and concerns were not how to collect more taxes and make more money, but his heart was gripped by what he was learning and discovering every day from Jesus, from the teachings of Jesus by observing Jesus and following Jesus and witnessing and seeing the miracle happen after another. He began to learn that God created human beings in God's image. God is holy and just. But at the same time, this God was not just a, uh, someone who gives laws and, and punishes people who break the laws, but he is incredibly loving and compassionate and tender and, and gentle and long suffering that he loves people. And Jesus, as he expounded on the nature and the character of God, Matthew probably understood that people must matter to God because God created them in his image. And if people matter to him because God loves them, People ought to matter to me, to all of us. No matter their background, their race, or their ethnic background, we ought to love them, Matthew probably thought. Matthew began to understand that there is a calling on his life. He was surrounded by people who did not know Jesus like he knew, especially his tax collector friends, his colleagues, his cohorts. 
with whom Matthew has so, spent so many years living together and developing friendships with, and even collaborating in order to make policies and decisions so that they would be able to have some type of uh, so-called common benefit as a policy so that they could add to their personal assets. And he realized that they were tax collecting friends with their families and friends and associates who were clueless about God and his kingdom. His heart began to fill with gratitude as he continued to follow Jesus. But his life was also at the same time filled with a newfound meaning and purpose. And yet there was a hunger inside of his heart that he could not really uh, control. For the first time, he began to understand worshiping Jesus is worshiping God, for Jesus is God incarnate. The one for centuries, countless number of prophets had spoken about, but this Jesus, God, invisible God became visible. And God, whom people thought was incredible to believe, became credible because of all the miracles that he was performing. And one evening, Matthew, as he was reflecting on his own life, now he found grace and how he was growing in the understanding of his grace and his relationship with God. Although he was despised by his own people, Jesus called him to be his disciple, a follower of Jesus. And he wasn't based on his spiritual qualification or religious excellence. He was with Jesus, not because he, had, he was morally spectacular, better than anybody else, but it was sheer grace that he, it offered him to become a follower of Jesus. And somewhere along the line, there was a shift that's taking in his heart. Matthew wanted his friends to meet and get to know Jesus. He wasn't courageous like Peter, he thought. He wasn't as articulate and, and vocal as James and John. He tried to look for what he could possibly do for his friends. And he decided to throw a party. Because as a tax collector, as an accountant, he had organized and invited many dignitaries before for, of course, according to uh, business purposes. But this time it was different. He had a different purpose for this particular dinner. He would invite his tax collector friends and he would invite and tell his friends, you could bring anybody, you could bring anyone you want to bring to this dinner. I will prepare, I will just, go all out and prepare as much food for people, as many people that you could bring to, to dinner. I will take care of that. So the scala must have been sort of the talk of the town. And the, when the evening came for the dinner, everyone heard about it had come, including not only the tax collectors, but also the Bible simply says the sinners, and even uninvited guests like the teachers and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees had come. Because, again, this was a talk of town. The religious leaders were very upset when they had seen the scenario unfold right before their eyes. They saw Jesus eating with the sinners and tax collectors, and they became very indignant, the Bible says. And they would murmur, why? Why would he mix with these social outcasts? The people we don't hang out with, we don't even want to associate with them because they defile us, they proudly said among them themselves. Even though they were not speaking to Jesus upon hearing, Jesus turns to them and tells them this. On hearing this, the Bible says, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And friends, after the party was over, <clears throat> one pastor in the U.S. would continue to describe, I imagine Jesus going over to Matthew and putting his arms over his uh, Matthew's shoulder. After the guests are all gone, Jesus was helping Matthew clean up. He was picking up the dishes and perhaps even doing the dishes. Jesus coming over to Matthew and, and then 
striking of a conversation. Matthew, I really loved your party tonight. I had so much fun. I met so many interesting people. I met so many precious people. There are such an awesome people. Thank you for organizing this. Now, Matthew being stunned over uh, the unexpected compliment coming from his master, Jesus, Matthew still feeling sorry for the, what the critics have said. Uh, Jesus, I'm sorry that you were put on the spot earlier today. Their accusations of you mingling with the sinners. And before he could finish that sentence, Jesus interrupted him. He may have said, do you know, Matthew, what I dream about? I dream about a day when my followers' homes will be filled with people far from God. Coming to hear about, learn about my father. Whether they believe the message right here, right there and then, regardless. But they will continue to share the gospel. And that my followers will sacrificially meet the basic needs of people in their homes, in their schools, in their neighborhoods, in their places of businesses, in their places of research centers. In fact, even for those that are far different from them, that they would simply love and serve them and, and live their life in such a way that basic human needs will be met by followers who are called by my name. And I believe Matthew began to understand that true worship is living your life with God as the ultimate priority, having the ultimate priority place in your heart. We say we worship our God, but in reality, we worship our own desires. Friends, um, there are great um, number of quotes in, in the study today. And I really hope and pray that you will get to discuss some of them. But Rebecca Pipper uh, continues on by saying this, whatever controls us is really our God. Whatever decision, whatever choices that we make, whatever thoughts that influence our, our uh, mind is really our God, she is saying. Jesus' ownership of our lives is not a control that manipulates us or takes us away our dignity. He governs our, our lives by being who he is without compromise, by insisting we become all that we are meant to be, created in God's image. God created us for himself. And if we live with any other center other than Jesus, we'll be living in completely he would say, she would say. Friends, we know that um, we, we manipulate and we try to convince ourselves that even though we're living for God, we say we worship God, we honor God, and we're a follower of Jesus Christ. But if the truth were known, our heart is far from worshiping the one who saved us, who redeemed us. And yet, we try to explain a way why we do certain things motivated and really compelled by our own desires. And this is what um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. And we justify our own desires by redefining grace to be cheap, by elevating our own noble causes, whatever how and how noble that might be, it cannot displace Christ. It cannot displace God. But we rationalize, we justify, even moralize our positions and understandings to cheapen the grace of Christ. The costly grace that God did not think twice about crushing his own son, a too great of a price to pay for your life and my life, for him, heaven without you in it, heaven without Dr. Kim in it, heaven without Audrey in it, heaven without Ken in it was not an option for him to even consider. So he paid the price with the life of his son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I could be with him in heaven. And I know that there is an extensive study on this matter 
of costly grace versus cheap grace. And I really pray and hope that today's study will help you to be really stretched. And in the study, um, Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller asked a number of questions for us to really um, muse over and, and be honestly wrestling over with these questions. Do I really worship him? Do I really honor Christ? Do we really give our ultimate allegiance to Christ Jesus? Or is Jesus worship service, prayer services, church services, mission services, outreach services, just the various forms or means to get we really, really want in our heart? Because, friends, we know that there are so many different things that that we, our hearts, really pursue almost as a shadow mission. We pretend to honor God, and we we even put dangerous lyrics and, and uh, tremendous confessional lyrics on our lips, but our hearts far from it. So Pastor Tim, Tim Keller says, am I willing to obey whatever God says about this life area, no matter how I feel about it. I believe this is really a question that we need to wrestle with. And am I willing to thank God for whatever happens in this area, whether I understand it or not? Friends, there are so many different circumstances that are just simply militating against us. We don't like it. We just don't understand it. But are we willing to Accept the things that we cannot change and surrender to God in such a way to worship him. So whatever happens, even in this most critical area, that we will still be grateful for what God has done. And is there something in this area I am relying on more than God for my hope and meaning in life? Friends, I know that as I, as young people, aspiring next generation leaders, all of you have an area of passion. Sometimes those passionate areas, the, the holy burdens that, that you all have in your heart, that you want to er eradicate hunger from your nations, you want to get rid of diseases and illnesses away from your nations, and you want to save your people, and you want to make decisions and policies in place so that People of your nation, your, your ethnic group will flourish. Those desires are great. But are those hope provide you with the meaning of life that could possibly squeeze Christ from the center of your heart? Lest that happens, I pray that you would look your, into your heart and really wrestle with this question. Is there an area that I am relying on more than God for my hope and aspiration and what would ultimately define success for my life or provide purpose and meaning for my life than Jesus? And, and the fourth question is, are there problems or limitations in my life that I think are too big for God to remove? Friends, we, I know that a lot of times we are tempted to rely on these things that are visible and tangible and something that feels like we have a little more control over because we feel that God is not interested in helping me ultimately. So therefore, I am on, on my own to do this. And that could be the limitation that you are placing on God or problems that might be hindering and becoming a detriment to, to you fully trusting God. But is our God too small to deal with this? Or is your God or your understanding of who God is big enough to eradicate and remove and, and help you uh, to pursue? And, and really give your ultimate allegiance to him. And this is all part of worship. And the Bible says we need to worship God in spirit and in truth. 
And this could only happen with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the truth of his word. Now, we know this theoretically, but how can we do this practically? And I believe this could only happen if we really, really, honestly fall in love with him. And I know that much time has gone, but I just want to make an illustration by telling you another story found in later on in the Gospel of Mark. And, and the question is, do we really, can we really fall in love with God for who he is, for what he has done for us in Christ Jesus? While we were still sinners, God sent his one and only son to save me, save you, save all of us so that we could be in heaven for all of eternity together. To begin to realize the purpose for which God has created the universe, entire universe. And let me tell you by uh, telling you a story, one other invitation for someone to become a follower of Jesus Christ. We don't know, even know his name. The Bible does not record his name for us. But later on, chapter 10 of Mark, this is how the story goes. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knee before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, number six. You shall not commit adultery, number seven. You shall not steal, number eight. You shall not give false testimony, number nine. You shall not defraud, number 10. Honor your father and mother, number five. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. This man must have been incredibly moral and religious individual. This man probably was a model citizen. He was impeccable. And this is what the Bible says. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This is the only other invitation to come follow me statement was is indicated. You know, we could have had 13 disciple of Jesus. But this rich man, this ruler, uh, really rescinded and, and, and just could not accept Jesus' invitation. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his word, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. You know, friends, um, this is a sad situation recorded for us in, in the scripture. And um, now the di disciples were very, very sad. And disciples were amazed, the Bible says, even more amazed and said to each other, who can then be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mothers and father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, the question here is, Jesus, by, by pointing out that this young man, this rich young ruler, had done so many things right. But remember from um, the commandment number five all the way to ten, it had nothing to, no commandment that Jesus referenced to this young ruler. Um, did you have any other gods before Yahweh? 
Do you have another idol? Uh, have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Do you worship and honor God by remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy? He left the number one through four out of this equation. And some of us are thinking, you know, uh, if I were to ask you, how can you be saved? Or how can you receive forgiveness and uh, receive eternal life? No one would say, go sell everything that you have and come follow Jesus. That's not even the equation. Because we speak about gospel of Christianity being about grace. We are, we are accepted. We are, we are forgiven freely, simply based on faith. This is not even the formula, but why did Jesus do this? I believe Jesus was pointing out and teaching us in the process that our hearts is attached to something that we love so much. For this young ruler, he loved his possessions more than he loved God. He loved his achievements more than what he was claiming um, for making confessions uh, for, for God. And Jesus is saying, you cannot have a divided heart. You have to love God and you have to uh, love people around you for the sake of what God has done for you. And some of us might be thinking this story does not apply to me because I don't have I don't have any money. And perhaps this problem with the young, rich, young ruler doesn't apply to me because I don't have this issue. But do you know that we settle for so much less? We don't follow Jesus because of our stubborn knowledge. Yeah, we don't have much money, but we have certain knowledge that we think are so precious that we simply cannot let go. And I believe that science is more important and valuable standard to guide my life than what the Bible says. So therefore we cannot yield and surrender. We have an area of our life that we live in immorality, deep seated sin in our life. That's something that we don't want to give up. And we know we don't want to choose to follow Jesus because we don't want to give up. Then there are our own idols, success, marriage, business, political or social positions and accomplishments, recognitions, the images that I have worked so hard to achieve and certain goals and objectives that only I know about and I submit to you. How do you follow Jesus? You need to make a decision to surrender first. A decision you make today will shape your tomorrows and the decision to choose what and whom you will worship will determine all of your eternity. And I pray that the most gentle and the powerful Holy Spirit will nudge and guide your heart to surrender your life to Jesus without delay. And that's my hope and prayer for all of us, including myself. We need to rededicate, resurrender our lives, and we need to recalibrate our heart's worship. And we need to make adjustment where it is necessary for us to fully and holistically and purely love God. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we... We um, thank you for this worship service. Uh, first of all, Father, we, we are embark embarking upon this uh, second season of Gospel Christianity, and we will be looking at how to uh, actually do and, and live out this Gospel Christianity life, Gospel-centered life. And first of all, we ask for your guidance and your spirit to navigate our steps and help us along the way. And Father, today we have seen how when Jesus called his disciples, they left everything to follow you and begin to worship from the bottom of their heart. 
and gave their allegiance to you. And for their faithfulness for 2,000 years, the gospel has been carried and, and communicated to us. And we are so grateful for a countless number of people who remained faithful all throughout the years, even when the persecutions came. They did not give up, but loved you and obeyed you unconditionally. So that those of us living in the 21st century, in places like Seoul, Korea, would have an opportunity to worship you and study your word. Father, we thank you so much. But the challenges still remain the same because our hearts are so easily enticed to worship something else other than Jesus Christ. So help us, have mercy upon us, Lord. And help us to surrender, not to our intellectual ability to, to know and, and learn, but Surrender to your word and your guidance and your promptings. And, and collectively, Father, we invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us directly. So as we open up your word and study your word, uh, may the Holy Spirit make the word of God come alive in our hearts so that it would become easier for us to surrender and worship and to fall in love with you. And Father, we long for a day that SNU International Church will be used by you to help people to encounter you in person. And they too may come to know you and grow in the knowledge of what an amazing God we worship. So Father, to that end, use this church and use all of us. In Jesus' name, we surrender this prayer. Amen.